I'm Connor Walls and I'm here once again to talk about embedded software. Today I want to talk about self-testing. Now I talked about self-testing in another video and I was looking at the uh, testing of hardware around the uh, embedded system using uh, the capacity that the software has. However, what I want to talk about today is the software testing itself, testing its own integrity. Now, if we're realistic, all software has bugs. Well, actually I don't like the word bugs. All software has errors. It's written by human beings and human beings make mistakes. So what we need to do is to protect ourselves from those to the greatest extent. Now obviously, if you use good tools and you use good design techniques, you'll minimize the number of errors in your code. But things still go wrong. So if you want to build more reliable systems, we will design them in such a way that we can preempt problems to at least some extent. There's really two kinds of execution time, time uh, error which we can encounter, and they manifest themselves in, in, in two different ways. One is data corruption of some kind or another, and the other one is code looping in a way that's unexpected, usually a, a closed infinite loop which, which was unintended. Let's consider data corruption first of all. Now, pointers. Pointers are one of the best features of the C language and one of the most dangerous features of the C language. C would not be the language it is without pointers, but they need great care and you need to use them um, with the full knowledge of how they work. So you need to understand pointer arithmetic. Maybe we'll discuss that another day. And you need to bear in mind that the problems with pointers become worse with more levels of indirection. So a pointer to something is fine. A pointer to a pointer to something, that's kind of okay. A pointer to a pointer to a pointer, mm, it's getting more and more likely to go wrong. So think about that. Now, where else can we get uh, memory corruption from? Not much we can do about pointers, but there are other possibilities. The most common one is stack overflow and underflow. Now a stack is a fixed size, it's very hard, even though there are tools on the market that help you do this, it's very hard to measure the stack size that you actually need. If a stack overflows, it will corrupt some other data, and chances are you won't see a problem until much later, in which case it'll be very hard to figure out what went wrong, what caused this crash that your software experiences. And if it's a multitasking application, each task has its own stack, and when it overflows, it will corrupt something in another task. So one task will crash, but actually the fault is in a separate task. Very hard to follow. What can we do about it? What we can do is add guard words. Now, so here we have a stack. At either end of the stack, we have an additional word containing a value that we will recognize. What that value is, is up to you, but don't make it zero or all the ones. Make it an odd number because addresses are often pushed on stacks and um, uh, addresses are always even numbers. So make it an odd number and something fairly random. So there's then like a four billion to one chance of, uh, of a clash. So the idea is, so we've got a stack here, the stack pointer is pointing at the bottom and we run our code and after a while, the stack fills up with data. Now, if it completely fills up, we may be having a problem. But actually, what we'll find is at some point we'll reach a stack like this. So it'll be full of data and the stack pointer is pointing to the top guard word. Nothing's gone wrong yet. If this is as bad as it gets, we're in good shape. If, however, we push one more item on the stack, the guard word gets corrupted. Now the great news is we can detect that guard word corruption using a background task or something that keeps an eye on these guard words to make sure that they're, they're okay. And we can detect it before something has crashed because the guard word corruption means it hasn't wandered off into another stack or some such. So you need to, in addition to creating these guard words, you need to monitor them somehow. And you either do that from a background task or you do it from a, perhaps a timer interrupt service routine. It doesn't need very much code to keep an eye on a number of guard words. You can treat arrays the same way. Now arrays are more difficult because you can randomly access the contents of an array using a pointer. There's no checking of indexing of arrays in C because that's too much of an overhead. But the most common error with using arrays is to run off the end. 
So putting a guard word beyond the end of an array, so make an array actually a bit bigger than you declare it as being, and you're in good shape. So that's data corruption. There's something we can do about it, at least. Those are the most common causes of data corruption. What about looping? Code gets into a loop for some reason. The most common reason is it's waiting for something which is never going to happen. Um, so if you're waiting for an external event, make sure you code in some kind of timeout so that you don't wait forever. But let's assume that there are possibilities that are in infinite loops. What can you do about it? Well, the main thing you can do is put in a watchdog. Now, a watchdog requires some specific hardware, which if it isn't poked every so often, will reset the board or do something like that. Uh, that's fine if you've got it. If you've got a multitasking application, then you might want to have a separate task, which keeps an eye on all the other tasks and make sure that they're all active. Uh, it doesn't require much overhead to do that, um, and it does give you the security that everything is running nicely. The last issue is what to do when you find a fault. Depends on your particular application. If you can tell somebody about it, that's great. Um, in the worst case of a deeply embedded system, the only thing you can do is reset the, uh, the board. So start, you know, basically use, run the appropriate trap which causes the, the uh, processor to reset and start again. So in other applications, you might be able to display information. If you can log away what the fault was so somebody can see it later, that's good as well. So anyway, the key thing is to start off with an attitude, yes, I'm human, I make my errors, what can I do to make my system a bit more secure, bearing in mind there's probably errors in there. And hopefully this has been helpful. So that's it for today. And so until next time, I'll say bye for now.